I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to welcome you all um, to our third annual Distinguished Visiting Lecture in Digital Humanities and to introduce our guest today, Victoria Chabot. Um, Victoria received her BA from Williams College, an MA from Indiana University Bloomington, and an MA and PhD from the University of Rochester. Um, she is currently Research Professor of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies at Duke University, where among many other things, she directs the Information Science and Studies Certificate Program and the Digital Art History and Computational Media MA in Art, Art History and Visual Studies. Um, she was also founding Director of Graduate Studies for the Interdisciplinary PhD in Computational Media Arts and Cultures. Um, she also leads um, the Duke Digital Humanities Initiative that's based within the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. She co-directs the PhD Lab in Digital Knowledge and the NCCU Duke Digital Humanities Fellows Program, um, all of which is extraordinarily exciting. And um, we'll be happy to post these um, links so that you can see the programs that, that Victoria has been working on. Her teaching and research interests lie at the intersection of digital humanities and technology, media and information studies, especially in relation to spatial, immersive, and interactive media forms, um, with a focus on the study and creation of augmented reality experiences in urban, exurban, and exhibition contexts. Her recent collaborative archives-driven digital projects include Digital Durham, the North Carolina Jukebox, which is um, North Carolina Mountain Music, and Get App, which is an architectural history of the Venetian ghetto. A new project, Visualizing Lovecraft, explores the digital remediation of fictive places and spaces as a form of literary adaptation. She also co-creates video game-based art installations with Psychasthenia Studio and engages in digital art curation projects as chair of the ACM SIGGRAPH digital arts community. Her recent written work has appeared in Media and Communication, The Rutledge Companion to Media Studies in Digital Humanities, and the recent CLEAR report on 3D and VR in the academic library. Um, we're delighted to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Victoria Chabo. Everyone, thank you. Um, it's a really a pleasure to be here um, and to speak with all of you. I wish I could be there with you in person, but it's great to have this opportunity to have a virtual connection. I'm going to switch over to some slides, but I wanted to get the establishing shot of me as a slightly bigger head before we turn to that. So I'm gonna change that over now. All right, can you see that? Yes, yeah, great. So uh, as, we, as you saw, my title is The Virtual and the Digital Post-DH Approaches to the Collaborative Scholarly Practice. And ever since I sent that title in, I've been nervous about the fact that I use the term post-DH. I don't mean to imply that DH is over or anything like that, but I'm trying to think about the question of what comes next as we get into the new phases of DH as it manifests throughout our curricula and programs and research. As Kathleen mentioned, I have dual interests. I'm very interested in the digital humanity side of things, asking things like, how does the use of digital tools and methods transform the work we do in our scholarly communities, helping us to ask and answer existing disciplinary questions and formulate new ones? But then also, how do the study, creation, and critique of computational media and information and digital cultures empower us collectively and individually as users, creators, citizens, locally and globally? So today I'll be talking a little bit about this concept of the virtual and the digital and talking about it specifically in relation to some of my own projects before turning to some of the initial findings from the Virtual and Augmented Reality Digital Humanities Institute we've had going on for the last few years. And then thinking about how our new environment that we find ourselves in is asking us to think about virtual communities in different ways before projecting ahead into some future areas we might develop. Now, if we go back into uh, ancient history, I have a PhD in English and Victorian literature and culture. And one of my first forays into thinking about virtual reality was this virtual crystal palace project way back in 2008. And the idea here was to have this omnimedia uh, experience, database, website, installation space, where you could get all the different types of 
artifacts and texts, primary, primary and secondary and tertiary that relate to the topic of the Great Exhibition of 1851 and put them in one place. And I tried to think about that in terms of what sorts of different virtual environments would be the best front end for such a wonderful compendium. And so there's, you'll see here the Google Earth representation of the Crystal Palace with the map of the exhibition underneath. Um, you'll see on the right is an image of the 3D model that we put into our immersive cave space of the Crystal Palace itself. And then in the bottom, you see the Second Life version of one of the exhibitions in the Great Exhibition, which has some population of objects within it and has the benefit of people being able to intermingle with it. And so what we found is that each of these helps to tell part of the story, but there was no real way to put them all together into one glorious hall. You know, I did have this vision, the, and I even gave talks where I talked about the omnimedia system, database-driven omnimedia system, and I know I wasn't alone in this, this fantasy, this aspiration, this desire. It reminds me very much of Borges' story on exactitude in science with the Cartographer's Guild who struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. So I had this real hope that we were going to be able to through the mechanism of spatial immersive and interactive media, have a wonderful way into, into the everything. And that maybe even we could bring in some of the artifacts at a higher resolution, a higher level, that would enable us to have that happening within the virtual environment. I've also been influenced very much by people working in uh, game spaces where they combine the physical and the virtual worlds. This is an image from an essay called Play and Hybrid Reality, Alternative Approaches to Game Design that I read uh, soon after it came out in around 2009. And it has this idea of a physical world that we exist in, a spirit world, which I, I interpret in this case as being the virtual world, and then the mixed world, which is the lived experience of the artifacts and objects um, and effects and affects that happen when you intermingle the two. So throughout all of the work that I've done subsequent to the uh, Crystal Palace experiment, I've been trying to think about how to interrelate these, these three different elements while still also being aware of the fact that in order to digitize and to create such experience, you have to transpose everything from the physical into the virtual so you can create these correspondences between the two. So it's been uh, an obsession and an interest over the years. If you're familiar with the um, augmented virtual reality, mixed reality spectrum that Paul Milgram and Fumio Kashino created, the virtuality continuum back in 1994, you'll see that I tend to be these days mostly in the aug augmented reality space. And the reason for that is partly because I'm a really terrible 3D modeler, and partly because I decided that it would be more effective to think about specific channels of connectivity and annotation rather than trying to do this sort of comprehensive omnimedia system that I was describing. So I'll talk for now a little bit about some of the projects I've done with this concept in mind. So I also describe it sometimes as augmenting the digital humanities, or maybe to use more common terminology today, extending the digital humanities. And so what I'm trying to think about in a broader sense is how do we augment ways of thinking about DH work, whether it's text-based work or map-based work um, or other types of 3D reconstruction in order to take advantage of that middle space between the virtual world and the physical world and the fact that everything that we're creating still ultimately becomes embodied in the reader, observer, viewer, interactor of the individual and hopefully eventually the community. So the images here are an example of how this plays out with a, a project we've been working on called Building Duke, which is about the history of the campus, where you have architectural drawings of the prospective environment, you have images of the actual creation, um, and then you have this imaginary 3D reconstruction that is an annotation of the space that could be, in this case, accessed through a map. So trying to think about how this kind of technology allows us to do both a sort of reflective and representational uh, view of what exists, but then also be thinking about the differences between the prospective, um, the planned and the imagined, and what was actually created in the end. I also was briefly famous for talking about annotating the air um, as a way of thinking about how uh, augmented reality in space could be perceived as a way of creating that sort of hybrid reality experience 
in real time. This is an image from uh, an online exhibition or a virtual uh, virtualization of a physical exhibition. We were trying to plant some of the interactive pieces in other parts of the campus to encourage people to come to a festival. So over the years, this has intersected with my interest in, in digital archives and histories, um, as I started out with, in this case, about the history of the city of Durham. These images are from an app created in 2001 uh, that was meant to be a walking tour of uh, the city of Durham overlaid with the history of civil rights activism in the city. And you can see that what we tried to do here was find specific nodes um, or markers, landmarks within the city that were really important in the history of civil rights, and then to create an embodied experience of walking through the past by being in the space and understanding what it has to do. So again, there's this idea of being in the moment and having a both um, affective and comprehensive, or as I call it, comprehensive and apprehensive experience simultaneously in space. One of the things that you can see from these early projects is that we, we didn't succeed in overlaying the historic imagery on top of the contemporary architecture, although that became another mini obsession too, but instead made it at least a dialogue between these two things, building off the idea of guidebooks, but hopefully having more of a possibility of creating uh, uh, some, some new way of understanding where you are. Slightly later project, tried to do the same thing, but from a different angle. This was about the history of activism on the Duke campus. And here again, mining the archives, but in this case, finding photographic images of people from activist moments past, and then planting them uh, in the contemporary campus scene. So here again, we have an idea of collapsing space and time in order to show how something that was happening in the contemporary era it has had a history and how these can do coasts continue to live on. Uh, in the lower left hand image, you can see that there were some students with a tent there. They were actually engaging in an activist moment that was alongside the history of what was being represented in some of these earlier uh, moments of activism on campus. I also became interested during uh, over the last few years in this idea of interactive storytelling overlaid on lived experience of space. This is from a project that was called um, Inner Space Adventure, and it was set in the College Art Association Conference. And there were a number of augmented reality projects being shown at this time. What our project did was try to reimagine the story of you as a person who's at, at the conference, but then having these satirical experiences with, uh, that engage with the spaces that you're in. This one says, you're in the Hilton Hotel in New York City, a cavernous interior, marble floors, and probably living indoor trees, and a contorted metallic sculpture surround you. Conference goers and other travelers mill about hints of desperation in their means and eyes. You must take action. And so then you travel around the space and have these experiences that are overlaid on top of lived experiences of the space, but which are often in parallel with those that people who are actually at the conference might be having. So it's a, the kind of the comfort of, of excess in having something that is related to the specific experience of that audience in space. So I've continued to think also about augmented reality in terms of augmentation of print media. Um, these are examples of projects that took different uh, strategies for thinking about that. So the one on the left is a campus tour that uses icons. This is a student project generated by students to give a window into their perception of what was happening on campus. The one on the right was about thinking about how to annotate exhibitions with augmented reality. You'll notice I have Google Glass in there. I was one of the Google Glass pioneers who got to go to New York City and have a special fitting of my Google Glass, only to have it uh, end up collapsing a few years later. But you know, this is this idea of trying to think about augmentation in all its forms, augmentation of space, um, augmentation of experience, but then also augmentation of print media of various kinds. And we did some questionable things uh, over the years. This is uh, the Jewish cemetery in Venice and trying to think about whether it would be a good idea to create an augmented reality experience within the cemetery, something we didn't end up pursuing ultimately. And then other things that were more about bringing a documentary element more into augmented reality. This particular project was uh, one where students created icons about 
uh, different thematics uh, for experiencing in the city with the goal of getting people off campus and into the city. They did uh, short videos, interviews with uh, members of the community to find out more about the place that we're living in. So all of that kind of set the stage for projects that are trying to think about how to bring these augmented reality projects to life. Kathleen mentioned this in the intro. One of the projects that I worked on was called Get App, and it was uh, an application that was created to be a supplement to an exhibition uh, at, um, at the Plaza di Cali in Venice on the anniversary of the 500 years of the Jews in Venice and Europe. And so what happened here was there was a larger group who were creating this exhibition as part of this international visualizing Venice team that I'm a part of. And then a subset of us tried to think about how we could remediate some of the physical exhibition into an app. This term get app literally meant get app, get up, get up and out into the city so that you could uh, enhance your lived experience of the space of the historic ghetto through the use of the app itself. And in doing that, one of the things we wanted to think about was what are the, what are the key themes that came out of the exhibition that applied specifically to this whole idea of having this augmented experience and that we could really um, enhance your understanding of through the use of being in the space. And so we identified some of them as being enclosure in the literal space of the ghetto was enclosed, densification, the increasing population and a diverse set of communities, Jewish communities within the ghetto, the complexity of the situation and the environment there, which included basically a whole city within a city, and then this question of engagement, internal and external within and without uh, the city of Venice itself, within that city within a city. And so some of the kinds of interventions we created were specifically designed to help you to understand better what you were looking at through your lived experience of space. This particular slide is showing us how the uh, synagogues in the Ghetto Nuovo, for example, aren't necessarily visible to you if you don't know what to look for in terms of the five characteristic exterior windows. Um, the Scala Tedesca, which uh, is shown here, um, is something that you can get this kind of x-ray vision view into from the perspective of uh, different kinds of scans and virtualizations but that you can also understand as being a part of the life of the city that, that continues on today. One of the ways in which we really tried to take advantage of augmented reality, besides having uh, waypoint annotations, was to think about how we could create affective experiences that helped you to appreciate what you were viewing. So this particular example is an image of one of the places where there used to be an enclosed gate that would be locked at night for people coming in and out of the ghetto. Today, it's a little bit harder to tell that this is a place that was once enclosed. And so one of the things that we did was create 3D panoramas that would give you that sense of enclosure um, if you immersed your view in them. So the phone became a view, a view portal through which you could see the fact that there used to be enclosure and going, bringing back this idea of memory traces and ghosts. In this case, the ghosts are of structures past. And so if you were to look at these three panoramas in this particular instance, you would see increasing opacity that we meant to viscerally give you the sense, the apprehension, the apprehensive sense of the fact of enclosure. And I mentioned earlier that we had this dream of perfect uh, synchrony between the physical architecture and the virtual architecture. We still haven't gotten there yet technically, but we were able to use the panoramas as a way towards that. And throughout this process, what we really determined, and through some of the other projects, earlier projects I mentioned too, was that our app design was really facilitated in part by productive constraints. So, you know, I had this initial vision of the, the Omni Media Crystal Palace um, that animated my start into this realm. But really what I've come to see is that constraint of time, space, resources, and technologies is, is actually beneficial to us in creating these types of experiences. Um, I've been in a part of some other app projects where we hoped that we could give you access to everything and that you know, the, the app would be the portal into a rich archive of information. I'm still interested in that, but now I'm more interested in having the archive be a substrate and then having all these different kinds of experiences overlaid on top. 
So on the other side of things, at the same time as I was doing all this um, AR stuff, I was also really interested in the idea of game engines and virtual environments and what could be done with them to help us to understand uh, the affordances of that particular medium, but also to see whether some of these ideas, augmented reality ideas, could actually be applied within virtual environments or in the experience of virtual environments. So my colleague and I, Joyce Rudinsky, have created a series of art games under the Psychasthenia series. Um, our first project was a dome-based installation where people wore headsets and sensors and moved through a space that uh, was designed to create the experience of psychasthenia, which is a psycho, uh, 19th century term for uh, sort of neuroticism and um, anxiety, and uh, with the goal of having people think about whether the experience of being in this space was a creator or potentially um, treatment of that condition. And that's a topic that we really extended into our next project, Psychasthenia 2. Um, we describe it as an interactive artwork that explores the culture of psychological diagnosis and treatment within the context of a highly mediated consumer culture that often produces the ills that it reports to treat. It's a navigable uh, 3D interactive space. And this was uh, created on the conceit that by playing the game, you could move through uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs into the realm of self-actualization. So for example, if you wanted to meet your basic needs within our alternate reality world or our mirror world, you would go shopping for nostrums and cures while at the same time asking, answering important questions like whether or not you worry about your health. So those questions were part of uh, psychological tools designed to, to diagnose uh, and treat your condition. One of my favorite parts of this uh, particular game was the Mellow Meadow of Medication, uh, which is an all-too feeding place to inhabit. When in the game space, you would have this sort of pause where you would go into a lovely forest area with birds twittering, which would gradually resolve into a revelation that you are in fact taking pills and you're on a drug high. Um, but it was this idea too that these spaces can be effective, affective and uh, create a reality of a feeling of calm even within them. At the same time, going back to this idea of producing the effects you claim to treat, um, here we were diagnosing you um, about your anxiety while at the same time forcing you through a maze of paperwork, naturally judging along the way. But then finally, when you get to the end of the game, you happily get to your certificate of achievement indicating that you have been self-actualized. Now, this project was installed um, as a, at the current Santa Fe New Media Art Festival. Um, and the installation was in part where we get into this uh, productive tension between the lived experience and the game-based environment. Um, we thought of the space in this case as kind of an augmentation of the game experience itself. Uh, we built a room, set up a consulting couch complete with doilies and a nice wallpaper border, um, and even put an image of the mellow meadow of medication on the wall, like your therapist might do to help you feel calm. This installation was really satisfying to us because it blurred the boundaries between therapy, game, installation, and satire. Even if you thought you knew what was happening, that you just happened to be lying on this couch while you play the game, what we were hoping for was that people would feel a little sense of unease or ambiguity over the fact that they were. Um, having, uh, feeling a sense of being in this office space at the same time as they were playing the virtual game. And that's one of the things that's been really striking about everything in our game series is people are never entirely sure how to take it, whether it's actually a prototype for psychological testing systems um, or treatment systems, or whether it's more the satire that we imagine it to be. It's kind of alarming to me sometimes that people would think that it would be real, but yet, of course, this is the direction we're going in. Our next project, uh, Psychasthenia 3 Dupes, really has built upon the idea that all of your interactions in daily life are logged and judged. It's explicitly about data shadows and avatar selves and the ambiguity that exists between the two. So here the game opens with the sound of coffee pouring and you're set up at a desk. You're in the virtual work world with your computer. Your first thing that you're asked to do is fill out a human resources assessment. Um, to determine your best workplace um, setting. And of course, you're constantly interrupted with the need to go off and do things with your colleagues. So you go to see the company doctor, 
um, but then you also have to go to a work meeting where you have to interact with your colleagues, um, each of whom represents a kind of um, archetypal figure who is uh, also logging and judging your responses to what they say. So we have a sophist with a bold new plan for your workplace, a narcissist with his personal tracker, or the celebrity with her likes, all of whom are people that you have to encounter and play along with during the experience, leading ultimately to a boss level interaction where you simply need to endure. But the real high point and climax of this particular game is the moment after the boss level or in the boss's office in which you have to accept the EULA that allows you to continue the game making yourself fully complicit in our system. So in the background, once you click I accept and there's no choice for going forward, you seem to, you hear the psychotic, one of the recurring figures say, what a dupe. And you know you're fully immersed that you have become complicit in the system and nonetheless, there seems to be no way out. This is the point when we've observed people playing that they talk about how depressingly real it all is, uh, which leads to some interesting questions about fun. So finally, you find out what your workplace calling is. We determine that no measure is too trivial. We reveal that we've been judging you on the five factors of a success index. We reveal your spiritual twin, your nemesis, and then we show you the metrics by which you've determined whether or not you're going to be successful. Um, the five factors are normally in the personality tests for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. We've changed them to gullibility, grinding, glad-handing, subjugation, and internalization. And then based on how well you've corresponded with these, you are, you are given your workplace fate, whether it's a cubicle or the boss's chair or janitor's stool or something else. So as I mentioned, the installation uh, for this particular project is uh, internally is in a computer or on a computer. Unlike Psychasthenia 2, when we've shown it as in an exhibition, it's also basically just a computer workstation where it's really, it's unclear where the boundaries are. Um, and this is playing up again the idea that it's deliberately mundane and that the boundary between game, test, artwork, and critique is still present for us. Our newest projects um, uh, in Psychasthenia Studio uh, is Insomnia. This is a project that tries to take this idea of datification and logging of the self and turns it inward. So we're thinking about datification, not just of the workplace self and the ways in which your data shadow is enforcing upon you an avatar self that needs to be activated in order to succeed. But now it's also about the colonization of sleep and dreams and states of consciousness. Um, so for this, we are especially interested in the ideas of wearables and sensor sensors the notion of sleep settings that set you up to have uh, to be tracked, but also potentially to change your dreamscape itself. And so here again, we get into this idea of an XR thematic of no inside or outside. And there's um, a movement into more expressionist environments rather than those that seem to correspond more with workplace spaces. So if you think about both of these strands of my work, you can see that the augmented reality side has been more about thinking about ways into archives and, and new kinds of exhibition practices. Well, Psychasthenia Studio has been about the um, affective experience of being in virtual spaces, but also being an actor within those systems. With visualizing Lovecraft's Providence, um, which I'm undertaking with a colleague from the Visualizing Venice team, uh, we're trying to think about how we can turn some of these technological approaches into an understanding of the spaces of H.P. Lovecraft's imagination. And doing that both by visualizing some of the different kinds of spaces that he creates in his writing, um, and also thinking about how we can instantiate some of his perspectives, but at the same time also being aware, and this is really important for us, that Lovecraft's uh, work exhibits a kind of xenophobia and racism in its depiction of the monsters that is something that we also want to convey, but yet also convey it in a way that demonstrates a critical stance towards it. So how do you visualize, represent, interpret, remediate a literary work that has these uh, really interesting spatialized elements in it that also have these historical elements that I've been talking about, and at the same time, there's this element of uh, perpetratorness in the work that he's doing that we don't want to diminish. And so this is the challenge that we're actively thinking about now and you know, that I would love to hear people express some ideas about as well.
So there is this kind of scientific specificity of him talking about real spaces, locations, historical figures, and at the same time creating this imaginary that's fascinating and has had a long life even beyond um, his, his life and into popular culture today that we want to address. And these kinds of questions become as important as well, important in, as well in thinking about other types of work. So I mentioned the, uh, the Get Up project was part of a larger Visualizing Venice, Visualizing Cities project about the history of the Venetian ghetto. Um, some, I'm working with some colleagues on thinking about the Krakow ghetto and the surrounding camps as part of a Visualizing the Holocaust project. And here again, we get into the much higher stakes, uh, perhaps even than Lovecraft, in thinking about how do you or don't you represent atrocity. Um, it's some, a subject that's had a long history of people talking about and thinking about it from the sense of, of photography um, and imagining, imagining and remediations through film and, and novels and things like that. Now we're trying to think about how can we responsibly use these types of media forms to bring uh, testimonies, uh, for example, into spaces um, and, and when not to. And sometimes we may decide, like we did with the cemetery project, that, that there are where, places we don't wanna go. But through all of it, what I'm ultimately trying to think about is how the relationship of these scientific and quantitatively based approaches can coincide with more artistic and humanities oriented perspectives including thinking about affective and embodied experiences and how they relate to historical and archival materials when we put them in dialogue with each other in these kind of hybrid media environments. Um, I don't consider VR necessarily an empathy machine, but it does have effective power. And we know that personal accounts, oral histories, and individual stories do have a, a tremendous impact and aid in both comprehension and apprehension, just as looking at these other types of uh, pieces of evidence do. So trying to think through this kind of complex question through the lens of virtuality and augmentation is my, my personal objective. But now I wanna turn more broadly to what the larger community that I've been working with has been thinking about. So the NEH supported a virtual and augmented reality digital humanities institute that started out in 2017, 2018, we had our first meeting and we had our last meeting uh, just uh, this past spring in the before times. We had a lot of different people involved in the project, uh, people who were working in art history and archaeology, history, journalism, languages, literature, media arts, music, information visualization, architectural engineering. And they're interested in, in a wide range of VR, AR, or as we started just calling it, extended reality applications, things like historical reconstruction, cultural heritage apps, digital storytelling, language instruction, representation of fictive spaces, media performances, archival and data exploration, and they were making all sorts of things um, along the way. Some of them are more in the virtual world and game environment. Some of them are more interested in 360 video. Some of them are more doing AR. Some of them are more doing multi-dimensional data visualizations. And the technologies of viewing and perceiving range from high and low ed headsets to cardboards and mobile devices, websites and 2D screens, Internet of Things, devices and haptics. So there's a wide range of applications and interests but one of the things that I keep thinking about, and this is especially true because I'm teaching a class called Media History Old and New right now, is the extent to which we are still in the stage of um, what Tom Gunning um, calls the operational aesthetics, bringing, um, bringing out of Neil Harris's study of, of P.T. Barnum into film studies, and that we can extend into the study of VR. And this is something that my colleague Shane Denson brought to our attention, the idea, this idea. Um, it was, that the, what we're seeing in many cases is simply the fact that we can do this technology, we're demonstrating it. And so many of the projects that have been done, especially outside of the arts and humanities community, have been a proof of concept. They might use cultural materials, but the goal isn't really for us to think about those cultural materials, but rather to use them as an interesting example to fire the imagination. So how do we get past that? How do we think about creating work that's actually taking advantage of the medium, that's taking advantage also of the wonder, the utopic potential, the dystopic potential, the excessive response that people often have with the introduction of new media forms uh, in a way that's actually uh, productive. So how does this medium come of age for us? And perhaps not surprisingly, uh, given that this was a group of academics, everybody was also very worried about the question of how working within extended reality, virtual and augmented reality would impact their careers what would count and what wouldn't count. 
And so one of the things that we talked about was whether the guidelines that exist in the various scholarly communities would actually apply to this kind of work. So we looked at the Art and Architectural History Guidelines, the um, American Historical Association Guidelines, the MLA Guidelines, which I actually helped to revise when I was on an MLA committee, the four C's and others. You know, to what extent do they give us perspective on this kind of work? And they do, but I think that what we now are now needing to see as DH comes of age and across disciplines is more specificity for the, the particular types of work that we're doing. So one of our goals for this project um, as a group, the Vardy group, was to begin thinking about, okay, well, what would the standards of evaluation be? What are the rigorous standards for VR and HR so that we can get beyond just the operational aesthetic or wonder factors and into something that is helping us to bring this work into the future? So in dialogue with our colleagues in computer science and engineering, we focused first on thinking about scientific measures. So how do people who work in these fields on the scientific side um, analyze them? And they talked about things like the user interface and experience design, the graphic design and accessibility, response time and latency of the system, the quality of the documentation, the presence or absence of negative effects in the experience like motion sickness, um, biometric measures of presence in VR, are you responding to it as though it were believable, memorability of the experience, comparative analysis with other forms, does this actually work better than some other uh, media technology that you're using to get your goals across, and then, of course, uh, our friend emotional impact, for example, empathy. And yet, if we're going to judge our humanities XR projects by these standards, we might be missing out on some of the other ways in which uh, extended reality can be an effective medium for producing and sharing new knowledge. Um, in Defining Digital Humanities, Julia Flanders talks about the productive unease of 21st century digital scholarship as centered in part around a new awareness of the process of representation. And perhaps nowhere is this concern more visibly a challenge and maybe an opportunity than in the research translation into technologies that push into these dimensional, immersive, and in some cases, affective realms. So this leads us to think about the idea of creating productive unease in our extended reality representations. So destabling hierarchies of primary and secondary sources and foci, signaling ambiguity and conflicts, representing uncertainty and change over time, highlighting the subjectivity and the position of the observer, offering access to underlying data and information for purposes of critique and amendment, providing visible engagement with a scholarly argument, framing with context and documentation, sometimes contradictory, allowing for those contradictions to surface, and of course, adhering to emerging standards within sub areas engaged in these topics, even when it causes friction. And yet, to the extent that all these things are maintaining critical distance, um, and creating a, a, a troubled sort of VR, AR, XR, um, they may undermine the very benefits of working in this field in the first place. So how do we insert all of these scholarly sort of concerns that come out of humanistic um, critical media studies critiques of something like virtual reality or augmented reality, um, and yet simultaneously also be able to take advantage of some of these effective moments? So in part, one answer is to create deliberately single channel or limited sorts of experiences, um, but perhaps to keep them on honest, our XR interventions do need to be overtly curated assemblages of different effects, basically the exact opposite of my fantasy omnimedia system. And of course, all of this work is necessarily done in community, community collaboration and connection as being important to the ways that we understand um, the work that we're doing together, um, I mentioned how critical it was for us to be talking to our colleagues in computer science and engineering, um, both because they knew better than we did certain aspects of how to understand this work, but also because if we're going to do really high level collaborations, we need to have everyone be partners in the endeavor. You know, just like we don't want to be the people who are, are creating illustrations or interesting examples for them to work out their technologies, they don't want to be the service providers who are creating something to our specifications. So it's a recentering of the work of digital humanities in a way by making sure that digital humanities is, is owned by the larger community and that it has this critical approach to it. So one of the ways that, that I've tried to help to make this happen on a structural level is to, um, to support and create and in some cases to lead different programs. Kathleen mentioned in my intro, and we were chatting a little bit before too about how I have all these different 
projects and groups and initiatives that I'm a part of. And part of that is because we're still trying to figure out what the best models are. And I'm hoping that I can talk with some of you in our discussions later today about what works and what doesn't and why. One of the things that has been really important to us has been creating an interdisciplinary PhD program in computational media arts and cultures. That program enabled us to bring together some of the theory practice uh, ideas that, that we've all been toying with in different ways and make them accessible in a very small program. But it is a small boutique program with only a few students. We also wanna have broader ways in which people can get involved in these conversations. And this is in some way, I think, mirroring a lot of what you do at MSU with your own uh, different labs and communities. So some of the ones that I'm most involved in um, are the XR Studio, Extended Reality Studio, which grew up in part uh, alongside the Vardy Institute, um, but then also in dialogue with things like the Digital Archaeology Lab, the Duke Art Law and Markets Lab, which is more focused on data, the Emergence Lab, which is more focused on media arts, the Social Practice Lab, Information Science and Studies, Speculative Sensation, which is more about theory, and then of course the Wired Lab for Digital Art History and Visual Culture, which is approaching all of these questions much more from the angle of what does this give us specifically in the discipline? And then there's affiliated labs and research groups as well that exist around campus that we're also regularly meeting with and talking to. On the other side, outside of the CMAC and Art Art History and Visual Studies communities, we also have the Digital Humanities Initiative, which maybe is somewhat similar, although maybe different to, uh, to the the umbrella digital humanities organization that you all have. And in this, we've tried to figure out how to create virtually something that brings together the individual groups and communities while at the same time allowing them space to do their own activities. The PhD Lab in Digital Knowledge is a group that comes together every year of students uh, who get a small fellowship and meet together regularly to talk about their projects, to share ideas, um, and ideally to form working groups and, and a community amongst themselves. Uh, we do some uh, events and, and peer review and networking through that space. At the same time, the Duke NCCU Digital Humanities Fellows Program is for faculty at a nearby institution, North Carolina Central University. It's a historically black university who is, has much more of an emphasis on mass communications and works closely with the city. So trying to think about how our digital humanities interventions can operate in tandem with theirs. They've developed their own digital humanities lab and we're looking together at ways to do collaborative research across the institutions. At the same time as we've been doing all this, I mentioned the Wired Lab for Digital Art History and Visual Culture. And while we were doing the Vardy project, we were also doing this Advanced Topics in Digital Art History 3D and Geospatial Networks Institute. That institute is a very international group. And I bring this up in part because the, uh, it was sponsored by the Getty Foundation. And here the goal was actually to bring teams together. So we brought teams together who are working in different uh, digital history and visual culture projects that included both the historians and the technologists and intentionally having them work in small groups. Um, this comes out of the Wired Lab in Digital Art History and Visual Culture, um, which is a sort of model for it, but extends to a global network. And like the Verdi group who came to group, uh, to Duke, this group met for two summer sessions together to workshop projects and talk about ideas. We've also had sessions at College Art Association um, and created a virtual community through regular meetings. Now, six months ago, I might have ended here with an affirmation of the importance of virtual and conceptual communities alongside physical communities and the ways in which, in order to do this work together, we need to really bring both sides to the table um, recognizing that many of us who work in these spaces don't want to identify as only the technologist or the media theorist or the historian. But we also have a bit of a crisis going on. So we are trying to, to create and sustain these virtual communities and yet we are in this space in which by being entirely virtual we're not quite sure uh, how we're going to be able to sustain that. Um, this particular article that I've, I've popped up here talks about the limits of virtual conferencing and how being reduced to words um, or just gestures within these small screens can be exhausting, but because of the single channel of relying on the verbal without having body language, but also the excessive attention that's required to try and watch all the little screens, 
And for those of you who have been teaching this semester online, which is probably many of you, or who've been taking classes, you know how hard this is. So this, uh, so this essay kind of gives us the sense of anxiety um, about what we're doing in that space and the need to be performative and hyper attentive, which leads me to, to wonder whether maybe our goal should be discontinuous partial attention. The same thing that the, in the same essay, there's discussion of how um, for some people, um, it's actually better to be in these kinds of virtual environments. Um, they're maybe not neurotypical and find it better to focus or engage in a single channel kind of way. So maybe something that we can all think about doing a little bit more, of course, is unmuting um, the video and audio, but then thinking also about extending these concepts of limited channels that I was talking about with extended reality to our experiences within virtual environments. And also keeping in mind the larger question of whether you really have Zoom fatigue or is it just existentially crushing to pretend life is normal as the world burns. So there's this tendency also to want to project onto new technologies the best and the worst of everything that's going on. And again, as I mentioned, I'm teaching a media history class this semester. And so I'm seeing that over and over again as we talk about um, photography or the telegraph or you know, the development of moving images um, or uh, automata that, that we want to project the best and worst onto whatever the latest technology that we're working with is. Nonetheless, I'd like us to be thinking now about this question of productive unease as it applies to XR, not just in our representations, um, which is what I was talking about earlier as one of our findings of the Verdi Institution, Institute, but also in the ways that we think about collaboration. So if we're thinking about destabilizing hierarchies, maybe also think about destabilizing conversational leadership, signaling ambiguity as it exists throughout the relationships that inhere in our collaborations, representing uncertainty in our goals and our purposes, um, as well as in change over time, highlighting subjectivity and position of the observer, but also the collaborator, offering access to underlying data and information um, in the sense of flipping the meeting time so that we spend more time on the discussion, uh, but putting the, the content uh, that we're studying in the background so we can shorten the meeting time, I say, as I'm in an hour long talk, uh, providing visible engagement with scholarly argument, but also each other, framing with context and documentation, um, the points of view and the priorities of the individuals involved, and adhering to adverging stancers, but also acknowledging that's creating more work. And as we do that, also realize that this virtual community that we're starting to create is also getting closer and closer to the game spaces and imagined worlds of, of uh, virtual reality. You know, I can't help but think back to uh, Second Life when it was a thing and the ways in which we were all trying to move ourselves into that space. Um, we can do things like curate our backgrounds and you can see that I have a background set up now um, for my particular video. Uh, we can also add on virtual makeup. You know, this puts us closer and closer to avatar selves um, that are not, uh, but what, what obligation do we have to be authentic in this space? Um, and what happens if we're not authentic in this space? And what messages are we sending? So in this case, this is the image that I use for the media history class. It's um, windows in our library looking out towards um, the, ca the campus quad. And the goal here was both to remind people that they're in class on campus, but also to invoke a sense of the university and the sense of history. Um, and to encourage them to be thinking more about the uh, 19th century media than necessarily about the contemporary techno landscape, which is in part why I don't use a background of the space that I normally actually work in, an old tobacco warehouse, which of course conveys its own rhetoric of startups repurposing and gentrification. So here I'm trying to use the, the rhetoric of the Zoom background to help put my students into a virtual experiential space in order to have an affective response to what's happening within the classroom setting, the virtual classroom setting. And of course, at times, um, this glitches out. Um, and you can, this, this example, I think is funny because it shows where the mind of one of my students might have been during one of our meeting sessions, but it also shows that we're in an unstable media kind of context. And so as we start to turn towards the idea of creating these virtual communities with the assistance of technology, we're not limited to doing the uh, teleconference, video conference. There's all sorts of places springing up. It's kind of a second life renaissance 
Um, you know, see so you see examples here of, of Gather Town or um, Zilla Hubs, Alt Space, Verbella, each of which allows you to have an ever avatar identity in a virtual environment, and each of which, to greater or lesser extents, tries to make it correspond more to um, the everyday lived experience environment that you might have in real life, but then also allows for the potential for alternate spaces as well. So I talked about this shift in our computer game projects that uh, Psychosthenia 3 was really trying to invoke uh, the sense of an actual workspace that you might be in. Psychosthenia 4 is more in this effective abstract environment. These are all choices that we can make that will have an impact as well in how we think about building our virtual communities together. Of course, we can also create our virtual communities in more traditional sorts of ways. Um, I recently co-edited a special issue of the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy on extended reality and teaching, teaching and learning in virtual spaces, where we gathered together additional insights into this question of how we use these technologies in our teaching. Uh, some of it has to do with training, some of it has to do with um, modeling, et cetera. So I encourage you to check that out, um, and hopefully we're going to be able to add to that conversation with our discussion of virtual environments. And finally, I want to end on a somewhat positive note about the value of virtuality. Uh, one of the other roles that uh, Kathleen mentioned in the introduction that I have is I'm the chair of the ACM SIGGRAPH Digital Arts Community. So SIGGRAPH is an organization that's focused primarily on computer graphics uh, professionals in industry and also in academia and computer scientists. The digital arts community is kind of a small side group that participates in but is, is a kind of pendant to the main action. Um, and the digital arts group has both a year-round uh, community that I, that I lead and does installations and exhibitions every year. So this year, the conference went entirely virtual, which was rather disappointing for a group that's used to large interactions. I'm talking, you know, like 15, 20,000 people. But we uh, decided that this was an opportunity to occupy this, this semi-hybrid space that, um, that we normally do throughout the year at the conference itself. So our most recent online exhibition that our community has created is called Digital Power, Activism, Advocacy, and the Influence of Women Online. Um, it was curated by Kathy Ray Huffman, um, an established curator and one of our committee members. And I wrote uh, an introduction to the show that became even more relevant than I anticipated when I wrote it. I'll read a little bit of that here. At a moment when we're all struggling to reinvent our home, work, and school lives online due to the COVID-19 crisis, and where social justice demands are bringing us to the streets nonetheless, potentially to our peril, the online environment, our virtual community, is an essential meeting place for activism, advocacy, and influence of all kinds. The focus on women's power in this exhibition, especially within the context of a computer graphics world that remains disproportionately led by men, highlights some major strands in the conversation. It's an important perspective to highlight and reflect upon as we head into the second half of 2020, where our everyday life will continue to be highly and necessarily computer-mediated where our lives, our bodies, and our experiences will be shaped from without and within by technologies of care, of surveillance, of communication, representation, and control. What comes after the crisis of the moment will depend in part upon the brave work women and men and non-barrier people, of course, I would say, are doing online. So one of the benefits that came out of this whole thing was that by being online, we we're able to invite in a much larger community of practice and of interested parties than we do normally. So graph is expensive. And even though we are able to give discounted registrations um, or, short, or shorter experiences to some of the people who get involved, they still have to come to uh, Los Angeles or wherever it's being held in, held in any given year. So we were able to do videos and post them uh, of the sessions that we offered and also have a greater community involved in the development of the sessions and the participation in those sessions. So it's kind of forced an issue that we've been sort of toying with for a while, which is how do we think about these big gatherings and how do we create um, hybrid spaces that allow you to both have the benefits of being present together with all that involves and yet also taking advantage of virtuality and community. So although we didn't get to have a viewpoint looking out over the city, we got to have maybe a virtual view of a space. And of course, the material world hasn't gone away. Um, the material substrate still exists for us, um, as I saw when I attempted to vote and saw that my car battery had died. 
um, we're actively living out the hybrid reality experience every day with glitches and false starts impeding our actions. Um, and I can't help but see everything now in terms of hybrid reality systems. Uh, much like our forebears began to see our bodies like our automata or more, or more recently our brains as computers. But whether we conceptualize our communities as virtual and DH as an augmentation of the humanities or as a disciplinary reality in its own right, we're now operating in a mixed reality world where the virtual has a greater impact than ever before. The work we do now is going to have a long lasting impact, not only for uh, broader community practices, but also for, for higher education in particular. And so, um, other than those nece necessary forays into the world, I am staying home gratefully, if somewhat grumpily and anxiously, from, uh, from time to time sharing the actuality of my material environment. This is where I'm actually sitting now, although I have my brick background um, that is obscuring it um, in my video window, while at the same time reaching out uh, with my newly crimped up avatar self, although I chose not to use the beard shadow or makeup for this talk. So as we peek behind the curtain, um, we can begin to continue to open up virtual possibility spaces in collaborative digital communities of practice. And I hope that when we do come back to more face-to-face -face interaction, we'll be able to identify the best practices we've discovered in our virtual sojourns and imagine, create, and explore more open, collaborative, creative, and equitable digital humanities hybrid realities. That's my real COVID-related work goal, maybe even more so than finishing my delayed projects from the, over the last six months on time. I'm trying to turn the crisis into an opportunity, recognizing the extent to which we're all doing this somewhat blind and it feels a bit perilous. And yet maybe by working together, it will be a little bit less so. Thank you.